And if we don't do very well in school, we tend to think we're not very intelligent. And of course, it's actually often the opposite that is true. You think about the world's greatest entrepreneurs. Many of them dropped out of school. Many of them will say, I did rubbish at school. So how you're nurtured and how you deal with it and what you do with it makes a massive difference to your success in life and even more importantly, to your sense of peace or your sense of well-being along that journey. Because there's an awful lot of very successful people who, oh boy, are so troubled in their brain. They live a precarious life, huge success and huge worries, no sense of peace. And if you do tackle the development of the cerebellum in an appropriate and effective way, you can transform all of that. Welcome to the ADHD Untangled podcast. My name is Rosie and I have ADHD. And like many other ADHDers, the majority of my life has felt chaotic to say the very least, due to what I describe as having a tangled brain. Let's get untangled and show the world what we are made of. Trigger warning. The Untangled podcast does cover some sensitive topics that could be triggering to some. So please be sure to read the full description before listening in. Please note that the majority of the guests on the Untangled podcast do have ADHD, including myself, which means we will interrupt each other, forget what we're saying and go off topic. Hello, Untanglers, and welcome to episode number four with me, Rosie Turner, your host and the founder of ADHD Untangled. This episode could not come at a better time because this week it's been a bit of a roller coaster. I have come back from an amazing retreat that I hosted in Greece called Discover Your Strength, which was incredible. Um, And I'm so happy with the results and how everyone, you know, they've left that retreat and they're taking really intentional actions towards a more meaningful life for them. And on top of that, though, I am now moving this week. So one word for you, transitions. They're not our friend, are they? No, they are not. So, um, yeah, I've been a bit unsettled. And the thing that has been helping me is getting back on my Zing performance cerebellum training. So if you follow me on social media, you would have seen me jumping around, eye tracking on the train, you know, doing all sorts. And it has been because I have been using this amazing amazing brain training app which has been said to be so effective effective for neurodiverse brains and I'm going to let Winford talk all the science around this but it's so interesting and what he has created is totally groundbreaking and I honestly see it being the future of treatment for ADHD and I cannot tell you the difference it has made in my life my sleep got better I had this inner peace I could focus more honestly I was really experiencing quite a lot of anxiety before I started this training and the biggest thing that's come from this so far is that it really really enabled me to let go of my anxiety and really focus on you know my work finding balance in my life again and you know all these different things so I am a real big advocate for Zing Performance. And that is why I'm sharing Winford's amazing story. He is a scientist and a researcher and the founder of Zing Performance. His actual story and the reason for creating Zing Performance comes from his own personal struggle that he had with his daughter, who also had ADHD. And it comes from turning that struggle into strength and his pain into power. Winford is the one of the most incredible men I've ever met. And I've never really seen so much passion come from someone to want to make the changes he wants to make. He is so dedicated and he is really out there making big changes. So the results speak for themselves. And if you want to research more into Zing Performance after this episode, there's going to be a link in the notes section. And I'm going to be sharing so much on this in my emails, in my WhatsApp group and on my social media. So this will not be the last time you hear me talk about this. I'm actually going to do a solo episode as well on my own experience. So look out for that. 
And I'd love to know your thoughts. So I really hope you get so much from this. And I really hope you go out there and look into Zing Performance because they are doing some amazing, amazing things. So I'm going to hand it over to Winford now because he's going to tell you in depth about what the cerebellum is, how it's affected in ADHD brain and what we can do about it. So let's get untangled and show the world what we are made of. So welcome, Winford. Can you tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you do and, yeah, background to your story? Well, I'm a, I'm a dad of four kids and uh, I'm, I've run a lot of businesses. Um, and today I'm, I've sold most of my big businesses, but I'm running a couple of schools. But my main passion is I'm researching the brain and how we can find all of that hidden potential in the brain. So that's me. I love boating. I love flying. I love all sorts of ordinary things. But my passion is finding all of that crazy possibilities, all those crazy possibilities that exist in every one of our brains. Thank you. And do you want to explain as well a little bit about why? Where did this passion and purpose, because you are very determined and you spend so much time, you know, researching and doing the work that you do. How did you get to, you know, finding this meaning and your big why in life? I've got four children and they all went to the same school, had essentially the same teachers and obviously the same parents. And yet one of them, my oldest daughter, really struggled. Everyone worked really hard with her. She could not learn. She couldn't concentrate. She was clearly very bright. She still to this day wraps me around her little finger. <laughs> but the fundamentals of it, she, she performed badly in school. And uh, finally, she was diagnosed with a condition. Uh, and I said, what can we do about it? Well, she's got to learn to live with it. Well, finally, she she was became depressed and she attempted to take her life. And what was ringing in my ears was was these experts saying she's got to learn to live with it. So I decided I was going to research it and I got some hope. And so I sold my businesses. They were all great businesses and I enjoyed running them, but they meant nothing to me when I'd got a daughter that didn't want to live. So that's what changed my life. And it that change happened on, on the way to the hospital after she'd attempted to take her life. And during that journey, I just committed to to doing whatever I could to find how I could help Susie Tra- change her brain they, they they tried medication it wasn't working they tried therapy it wasn't working tried special teaching that wasn't working so i decided uh, i got to take it into my own hands and in my previous businesses I'd, I'd always been a kind of innovator i'm a bit of a disruptor i don't try to be a disruptor but i seem to s- see patterns and i've pieced together pieces of research that end up with significant change in different industries and my why happened to be all driven by what I was watching my daughter struggle with. And it's been a very, it is, not has been, it is a very exciting journey. Even just this last few days, we've made another breakthrough in understanding uh, some some key areas. So it's, it's, I don't know when it's going to stop. Well, it actually can't stop until everyone is benefiting from it. Yeah. And so that moment when, and firstly, just to um, clarify, when you say was diagnosed, it was ADHD, was the? It, well, it, it, this this was quite a few years ago. It was dyslexia. She was actually dyslexia. showing all the signs. I think today, and certainly in America, she would have been diagnosed with ADHD today, uh, yeah. and possibly in the UK as well. You know, the, the conditions for for diagnosis vary but the biggest worry for everyone then was the fact that she couldn't read couldn't concentrate couldn't no. comprehend couldn't spell uh i think uh, god made sure that I, I i had in in susie every one of the symptoms nobody has all the symptoms she seemed to have pretty well every one of them uh, but whenever you've got those combination of symptoms you've got some you've got some diagnosis looming if you're not careful yeah and when and, and the day you got that phone call so how how soon after um you experienced that you know that devastating moment um how soon after was you like right this is it i need to do something about this i, I want to well well i was always researching and and the sequence of events while susie was 
was very troubled, very depressed. Uh, and uh, I was always researching. And one day I was, I was at the airport in Hong Kong waiting for a flight back to London. And I'd just given away a book that I wanted to read myself. So I, I was looking for it in the airport. It was Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, that book, my amazing book. Uh, and I was looking for that and found it. And right next to it was a book by an American psychiatrist. So I picked up that book as well and got on the plane, as I always did, took my sleeping tablets and started reading the book I'd just picked up. And it was talking about the cerebellum and telling me things that just, just made light bulbs go off all over the place. So the sleeping tablets didn't work. And as we landed in, <laughs> I was just finishing this big, thick book. Uh, and it gave me a clue. Well, I tried to work with that specialist. He didn't want to work with me because I'm, I'm not a medic. Uh, so that was a blessing because I immediately decided, within a split second, I decided I was going to do it. <clears throat> and then I found some professors who specialized in the part of the brain that I, I focus on a lot, the cerebellum. Uh, and that's that was the start of the journey. I was hooked. So, yeah. so it took me a couple of years from then to to really pick up momentum and find out there was real substance here. So I I sold my other businesses, and within months I was focusing totally on this. And just so went I, with it. I bought a school because I wasn't. I didn't like the way education was 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 not bringing out the best in people who had got these neurotypical conditions. Um, I started an examination board because I didn't like the way children were being assessed because it wasn't finding their intelligence. So I, I, I just went bananas and just got my head wrapped around the whole subject. And, and I, I eat, breathe and sleep it now. And thank God you do because you are doing such amazing things. And it's like um, I'm looking at like the description of this podcast and we talk about struggle to strength, pain to power. And yeah. you've just described that so well. Like that's obviously what you do. You turn the struggles into strength, pain into power, and then use it to help others, which is what we're all about. And have you always been that way then? Have you always had, you know, passion to problem solve and wanting to help others and share, you know, what you learn with everyone else? It, it does seem like I've got an unusual brain. I've got a load of pigeonholes here in the brain. And as I get mm -hmm. information, I park them in different pigeonholes. And so I, 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 I don't do initial research. You know, what I do is I, I go to the experts in any particular field and I find that they've made incredibly perfect, wonderful, beautiful pieces of a jigsaw. Yeah. But they seem useless at doing the jigsaw. Also, wow. I, I, my knowledge is very shallow but very broad, and I'm just doing a jigsaw. I'm taking research from Harvard Medical School, some more research from Sheffield, some from Rome, and some from Frankfurt, and, and some from, from all over the place. And I'm saying, if you do this jigsaw, you can create transformational change in people. Wow. So when the university called me in the other day to say, how are you doing this? I'm saying, I'm just doing a jigsaw. It's all there. It yeah sense if if you just study what different people are doing but one of the problems with research today is they have to fight so hard for funding they can only specialize and do research in their narrow little silo and yeah. that, that narrow little silo a piece of a jigsaw and they're not talking to the people outside of their silo so that, that that's the journey I'm, I'm not i'm good at jigsaws i'm not very good at doing basic research but i don't need to it's it's all out it's there there yes yeah, so you're shining a light on the amazing work other people have done exactly. and bringing it together because you're from the outside in you know like you're looking from the outside at what people are doing and then thinking yeah. right well this works so well together why are we not why are we not doing that let's let's bring it together and problem solve <laughs> exactly so we so one, one of my in fact my mentor for the last 20 odd years has been professor rod nicholson oh, and man. he's an incredible professor and I often, probably at least once a year, I make a point of thanking him that my daughter is alive today. Yeah, I give him the credit for it. And how is Susie now? So what? So did so he was the person that gave you the information on how to treat Susie once she'd come out of hospital and the medication wasn't working, and you went through all those trials. Yeah. Was that who gave you the treatment? Well, the no. Idea? It, the idea about the cerebellum came from a New York psychiatrist. Mm. Uh, he was using a combination, a cocktail of 
of of nutrients and medication mm. and psychiatric medication and I, I i liked the results he was getting but then i realized that that there was still medication involved and i didn't want that i believed and finally proved that there is a natural solution to this and wow. so the clue came from professor nicholson and he said to me one day he said he said i'm convinced that if you can find a way of stimulating the cerebellum uh that you can change it permanently and i said how he said well no one's ever done it so i took on a a very large team finally we had 400 people of oh a lot of doctors a lot of psychologists some physiotherapists some psychiatrists a, some neurologists a very wide range of people and we worked with 45,000 people and what we discovered was there are 45,000 different brains out there yeah <laughs> <laughs> at least and everyone needed a different type of stimulation so then we, we had to do a lot of work uh, collecting data from those what type of stimulation and I'm talking about exercise stimulation mm. what type we had in fact we use a combination of two types of exercise one is stimulating the balance organ and one is challenging the cerebellum and when you put those two together you create incredible change but the problem was everybody needed a different combination and and that's where the challenge was. And of course, technology has been moving on this last 20 years. And finally, now we've got artificial intelligence in place where we can read what's happening to someone and we can predict what is the optimal exercise they need every day for the 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, however long they do it for, they need to do it for. Mm. And we're all the time, we're fine tuning the stimulations, fine tuning the challenges. But what we're actually doing is changing the cerebellum. And the, the great news about changing the cerebellum is that when you do, it lasts. You know, you, yeah. you know, the cerebellum is just it's just wonderful. It's not like our normal memory, our, our memory for things we recall to our thinking brain. It's the same process as when we learn to ride a bike. Yeah. So if you learn to ride a bike, you can, like I did, I put my bike away for 25 years, I think it was. I pulled it out, dusted it down, got on it, and I rode perfectly. Mm. Because the cerebellum creates that kind of permanent wiring in us. And so the, the wonderful thing about developing the cerebellum the way we do it, it creates lasting change. Amazing. So I, I often get thrilling emails from people. Uh, in fact, I got one from, from somebody quite famous the other day talking about her son saying, I've never thanked you, but but this is what happened. She's a professor. She She said, this is what happened to my son. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, and he's gone from strength to strength. He couldn't read then. Now he's got a first-class honours degree and so on and so on. Oh, so I God. get those thrilling stories. Changing the cerebellum creates lasting change. So all we've specialised in is how to create permanent change in the cerebellum. And Nature, the other, you know, the scientific journal Nature, they produced mm. an article um, about three years ago now, saying the very combination of exercises we give multiplies stem cells in the cerebellum and in the hippocampus. In other words, the prime areas of the brain which makes memories, which makes fundamental connections. You imagine that creating stem cells, in fact, multiplying stem cells. So, so nature said that. I'm not going to argue with it. I'd for a long time been saying it looks like we're creating lots of neuroplasticity, which was fine. But when they say you're multiplying stem cells, boy, I didn't sleep for days. It is incredible, isn't it? It is like, I know we're going to go dig, dig deeper into it throughout this um, talk, but honestly, it's like you've created magic in my eyes. It's like, I know it's science, but it's like incredible, incredible stuff. Hello Untanglers, my name is Rosie Turner and I am the host of the ADHD Untangled podcast and I'm also an ADHD coach. I spent most of my life asking myself, what the hell is wrong with you? Struggling with the simple things in life that others could seem to grasp so easily and never understanding why I often felt like I was never able to reach my full potential and constantly fighting between who I thought I had to be in this world whilst having a deeper knowing that my life wasn't representing who I really was. I suffered badly, depressed, lost, confused, and tangled. If you are ready to change your story and start working with your ADHD brain instead of against it, head over to my Instagram, ADHD underscore untangled, 
or my website, untangledco.com, to book your free discovery coaching call with me now. Let's get untangled and show the world what we are made of. And in terms of the ADHD brain, so mm. should we start with what we see in an ADHD, ADHD brain and why? And then we can move on to how mm. the cerebellum help, you know, the training that you've created on Zing Performance, how this helps with all of those um, mm. symptoms. So firstly, can we have a bit of an explanation around why or how the symptoms develop in an ADHD brain? For instance, attention, hyperactivity, poor emotional control and impulsivity. So do you want to give a little bit of a background as to why? Through your research, you believe that we see this in an ADHD brain. Okay, I'll say something that might be a bit controversial, but uh, but this is what I am seeing. I'm seeing a, 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 a really strong pattern here. Most people with ADHD symptoms had some form of trauma in early childhood, some form of situation. Either it could have been in pregnancy, maybe the mother was ill during pregnancy, or something happened to her. You know, what the person I was working with yesterday, her mother got divorced during her pregnancy, uh, and that was a trauma. Another one had forceps at birth. Another one had some uh, a, a nasty situation in childhood. And just to be clear, this isn't thing, the parents doing things wrong. It can no. be that. But sometimes it's it's just unfortunate circumstances that are completely outside anybody's control. So often there seems to be some form of uh, emotionally stressful or, or or physiologically disturbing situation that the developing brain couldn't make sense of mm -hmm. and it changes the way the brain develops and and that often is it seems to be the trigger for these neurotypical developments in brains but there's a few things happen first of all the brain is wired up in a way that that actually makes different connections and we often see in, in ADHD wonderful creativity. Often they're so troubled with poor attention and so on, the creativity doesn't always come out, but it does in some. But the creativity yeah. is always there. It's making connections that other people can't make. So the neurotypical brain is, is, is going to be capable of huge things, but hampered by other things. Some things are highly developed and some things aren't. A bit like a rugby ball, it's eccentric. Yeah, eccentric. So it, it, it's it's so to, please don't think of that term negatively i think of it no as, i love it <laughs> i think of it as very positive yeah me too so but some aspects of development are slowed down they're delayed and what we're yeah. doing of course is trying to okay let's 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 overcome that let's keep all of the upsides and get rid of those some of those downsides so when you've got a cerebellum uh, the cerebellum is what creates connections it creates skills it creates processes and when the cerebellum is unable to create some types of process all sorts of things can become very very hard work so everyone that's listening to this now are listening so they're taking in sound waves and those sound waves need to be converted through to comprehended thoughts for us to make sense of what is being said when we are listening yeah Sometimes the brain of someone with ADHD hasn't been able to finish off the process of listening. In other words, there's an extra process needed to turn what sound waves into comprehended thoughts. And sometimes we say very cruelly, you can see the, the cogs whirring. What we, can, what we see is folk concentrating hard, turning what they're hearing into thought so that they can comprehend it. That really should happen effortlessly. And the cerebellum hasn't been able to finish off that skill. Right. So they have to work hard. And that can, that can apply to a number of things. If someone struggles with reading, very often it's eye tracking has not fully developed. So instead of their eyes going smoothly, their eyes are jumping around, going up and down and backwards and forwards, trying to take in the information. And of course, if their eyes are jumping around, what's going in is scrambled letters. Sometimes, yeah. they're, sometimes they're upside down. And every time they see a word, they see the letters in a different order. 
So you imagine it's really hard to get spelling learned correctly if every time you see the word, it looks a bit different. So for those that struggle with reading, and not all those with ADHD, but quite a few do, they find it hard work because their thinking brain is full of helping out the brain put the eyes in the right place. So when a skill is fully developed, you don't have to think. When a skill is only partly developed, you have to think. So yeah. any skill that's not fully developed, listening skills, reading skills, it can even be social skills or sometimes physical skills, any skill that's not fully developed fills up the thinking brain with stuff that really need not be there and should not be there. Now, yeah. the, the problem is the thinking brain is about 100,000 times slower than the cortex. So a fully developed skill that you don't have to think about Happens in the cortex. You don't think. It just happens. Yeah. But an underdeveloped skill is, is using the thinking brain, which is 100,000 times slower. And there's another problem there. If you've got basic skills <laughs> that require your thinking brain to be active, you're filling that with stuff that shouldn't be there. And the thinking brain is you're only capable of getting about seven things in there anyway. Whereas the cortex is capable of almost unlimited things happening at unlimited speed but so the thinking brain when when you're having to use that because the cerebellum hasn't finished off its job it fills up with stuff that shouldn't be there and this is where the second part of the problem is the thinking brain is where your executive functions are so control of attention control of emotions control of impulsivity All of these, even some of your basic memory functions, are all there as well. So all of the symptoms that you see in people with ADHD and with dyslexia and so on, they're all explained by the underdevelopment of the cerebellum, meaning meaning that, that, that basic skills are hard work when they shouldn't be. And the consequences of that is thinking brain is full, executive functions are poorly to be formed. So you can think of any symptom that folk from ADHD struggle with. It could be uh, poor organization. Well, organization happens here in the thinking brain. You've got to have enough space to organize it. And if you don't, you are disorganized. Yeah. Control of attention is here. If someone's attention is flipping from one thing to another, it's because their executive function isn't able to maintain their attention on what they should be doing so they become complete finishers and so on. So every symptom you can think of, Rosie, is is explained by this cerebellum hypothesis. Because the front of the brain is taking all the pressure when it doesn't when it shouldn't that, be. That's a great way of saying it. A great way of saying it. It takes all the pressure. So it's got pressure because the skills and processes we need to make everyday life simple and straightforward and effortless have not been finished off because the cerebellum hasn't developed properly. The cerebellum is great at making making connections that other people don't see. It's highly yeah. developed there. But in terms of finishing off some basic skills, it's not been able to do its job. Wow. So something just came to me, and this might be jumping off a little bit. So if once once you start to develop the cerebellum mm. and it starts to improve and take some of the pressure off the front of the brain. And, yeah. you know, we start to eliminate a lot of um, the symptoms and the traits that we're seeing with ADHD, for instance. Yeah. Another question I was just think just came to me, and this is new, that's just come to my brain. Would we also see an improvement? So obviously you were saying the cerebellum helps us see problem solving. It helps us be a bit more creative as well and stuff like that. Or, yeah. you know, you see that if we're seeing things. Would it improve our creativity as well? Like, would that be another thing? Would we see the strengths get stronger? I've never, never in all the thousands we've done, I've never seen creativity increase. But what I have seen is the ability to use and exploit that creativity Mm. comes far easier. So we don't increase intelligence. It's there. It's fundamental. We can improve skills like reading and listening and organization and, and so on. We can increase all of those skills. But that's separate to intelligence. Fundamental intelligence is there already. But when you've got more thinking brain space, you can do more with everything that you've got. Yeah, so you can start to really embrace those strengths you have and the talents you have. 
exactly. because you're able to get them out into the world, use them in your life. Exactly. But oh, it's so amazing. But one of the big issues with our education system is our education system kind of pro formers our perception of our own skills and abilities and intelligence. And if we don't do very well in school, we tend to think we're not very intelligent. And of course, it's actually often the opposite that is true. Yeah. So you think about the world's greatest entrepreneurs. Many of them dropped out of school. Many of them will say, I did rubbish at school. The world's billionaires, many of those don't read ever for pleasure because it's hard work, yet they are billionaires. Mm. But, you know, I'm not saying if you've got this, you're definitely going to be an entrepreneur or a billionaire because for every hugely successful person, there's somebody else with ADHD that's in prison or it's been unemployed. Yeah. So, so, so how you're nurtured and how you deal with it and what you do with it makes a massive difference to your success in life and even more importantly, to your sense of peace or your sense of well-being along that journey. Because there's an awful lot of very successful people who, oh boy, are so troubled in their brain. And they, 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 they live a precarious life, huge success and huge worries, no sense of peace. And if you d tackle the development of the cerebellum in an appropriate and effective way, you can transform all of that. Can you imagine if all these people that the entrepreneurs have done so well with what they have, they've probably got other people to do some of the skills that they don't yeah. do very well. But can you imagine if they had this underlying piece and they worked their cerebellum, what else they could have, they could go and do, you know, like and how they would feel about doing it more than. Well, have you, have you noticed? Have you noticed the most interesting people on the planet are those that have been labelled ADHD? Yeah. They're, I have. <laughs> they're, they're, they're thinking outside of the box. I mean, you must have so much fun doing what you do, helping folk with ADHD. It, and it's it's so thrilling. So, you know, what, what I'm proposing is that, that what science is teaching us now is that it is possible to keep all of that amazing thinking outside the box, that creativity, that, that total obsessive focus. Mm. You know, it's, it's so cruel to tell people with ADHD they've got poor attention. Well, maybe they have about some things, but boy, have they got incredible attention when they want to focus on something. Exactly. When they find their interest and their purpose and passion, which is what, like, you know, like what you've done with Zing Performance, like if you find something that you care about, we're seeing that ADHDers will literally focus on it so much that that's why, where the brilliance comes from and why they create yeah. so many amazing things. So well, what do you think in schools that is missing? Like how could like, obviously with your your training and stuff is is a real big solution but is it would you agree that obviously the schooling system just isn't set up either for our way of learning in general it, it, you're you're absolutely right it, schools and education departments are run by educationalists that's great they are brilliant at teaching mm -hmm. what they've got no resources for is to understand the ability to learn, the ability to take in information. So you can have superb teachers, and it's a bit like having a, a fire hydrant filling up a bucket. But if there's holes in that bucket, you've got a problem. And they, they've got they've got no tools to identify what's happening with the cerebellum, what's happening with those learning circuits and dealing with them. So I believe the education system should be complete turned upside down and th there should be responsibility given to them to develop the learning skills, develop the cerebellum. So what mm -hmm. teachers teach so brilliantly can be retained. Yeah. Can be used. And do you think it, it, like a way, because I know that you, we, we can talk about like, you've, like you're buying schools and you're going to start doing this for yourself and make it happen because that's the kind of person you are. Um, and, but is it because as well, should education be more individual? So instead of looking at a classroom and just teaching one way, expecting everyone to retain it in the same way is that is that is that is it because we should start personalizing education a bit more being you know making it more individual for different people well the the, the schools that i own have got very small class sizes so yeah. that so that teachers can give more one-to-one -one. but having said that if you develop the cerebellum those mm. children that were visual learners can become auditory learners as wow. well because the reason why someone is a visual learner is because their auditory circuits aren't highly developed. 
problem from the cerebellum. Likewise, those that are kinesthetic learners, and many with ADHD are brilliant kinesthetic learners. They are kinesthetic learners because reading and taking information in isn't easy. Listening sometimes isn't easy. So yeah. they, but because they're brilliant, because they've got this huge genius, they learn by doing. The yeah. thing in education is that the whole exam system doesn't measure intelligence. It measures regurgitation. And yes, one thing that, so one thing that ADHD f- folk are not good at is regurgitation. They want to do no. it their way. I've even come across maths teachers marking down someone with ADHD because they got the right answer, but they did it their way. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the best schools help children do it whatever way suits them. Yes. So I'd love to I'd love to completely overhaul the education system because the brightest people in this world at the moment are being served very badly, very, very badly. So it's it's after school is over that they discover their huge genius and they go and run a business or they do some wonderful research or they do something that's that's uh, that they weren't prepared for in school, but they get on with it afterwards. But the trouble is, even with those brilliant genii that we label with ADHD, they often still in their conscious or subconscious assume that the poor position they got in class at school represents where their relative intelligence is. Totally wrong. Let's turn that upside down. Yes. And and what you're talking about there is what I'm seeing with clients all the time. It's, you know, the self-belief, the self-doubt from all a lot and a lot of them report it come from school education you know they all say academically I really struggled you know and it's still there like you said it's in that in their subconscious brain well this gives a real scientific explanation as to why which then helps alleviate that feeling of self-doubt again you know giving them more confidence in themselves you know very good point Rosie can I give you the neurology behind that yes please so we always assume that confidence and self-esteem is psychological. Yeah. I see it as neurological. And here's the explanation. Whenever the thinking brain has to be involved in what we are doing, mm-hmm. our confidence is lower. Wow. When we are doing things automatically, sportsmen often talk about being in the zone. Where, mm-hmm. When they're in the zone, they don't need their thinking brain. They're just doing it and their confidence is up here. So because the underdevelopment of the cerebellum means that some everyday processes need to happen here in our prefrontal cortex, in our thinking brain, our confidence is being held down. So when you develop the cerebellum and those part-finished processes that are being performed here in the, in the, in the thinking brain, when they're moved to the cortex where they should have been anyway, mm. Taking stuff out of the thinking brain naturally pushes our confidence and self-esteem up. Now, when we did our very first research project, we did it in in a school in Warwickshire. And one thing that shocked us was that these children, after they'd done this, done it for a few months, they they were walking higher. Their chest was out. They were quietly confident and they were relaxed and they were smiling. And we had to go back to the neurologist and saying, there's something else happening here. <laughs> this isn't just because they're reading better and concentrating better and getting better marks. They're fundamentally deep inside feeling better about themselves. And so yeah. the scientists had to work it out and come back and say, well, this is this is what is happening. Confidence is more easily explained neurologically. And even more importantly, confidence is more easily fundamentally changed by developing the cerebellum, in other words, dealing with it as a as a neurological limitation. Yeah, and, and because things aren't going to feel like such a struggle. So you're going to feel like confident because you're going to just do things without thinking. You're not going to be struggling as much throughout the day or oh. when you're trying to do something. And is that, would you say that's called, is that like when people describe flow state? So like, would, would that come from that part of the brain as well? When you're, you know, when you're just in flow, you're creating something and it, does, it feels quite effortless because... It's just happening and you're doing well, it. Flow state is when you're having to you're having to do very few, if any, conscious thoughts. Yeah. The overall steering is happening here, but the all of the automatic processes are making everything happening. So flow state when you're writing means that those comprehended thoughts just flow out through your pen or through your keyboard without you having to process hard here. If you've got to be working out how to use your fingertips 
or how to type or how to spell a word. There's a huge amount of stuff that's happening here that's interfering with your flow state, just ruining your creativity. So yeah. the full automaticity you have. Just remember, thinking is at least 100,000 times slower than not having to think to carry out a process. Wow. So, so to come back to your question earlier about creativity, if you've got huge creativity, but the practical processes of communicating what you're thinking, either by speaking or by writing or typing, involves complicated processes here, your creativity is going to be impaired. So yeah. we don't change your creativity, but we do get rid of the problems. 100,000 times slower. It's so important. It's you know, such a big number. <laughs> Well, some neuroscientists are arguing it's a million times slower. Wow. Some are yeah. saying it's 50,000 times slower. So I'm using 100,000 as being a kind of modest middle of the road. It's massive, the yeah. difference. Would this explain a lot of the reasons why we see procrastination when we want to do something? Like, you know, when they describe oh. what what we know what we want to do, but we just can't do it. <laughs> you know, do you know that when we hear that about ideas? Very, very good point. Well, where are decisions made? Decisions are made here in our thinking brain, mm. and we know we need to take into account the important things, the not-so-important things, the short-term things, the long-term things. Mm. So if your thinking brain is actually full of stuff that shouldn't be there, you ain't got the space to take in what you know you need to take into account to make your decision. So all yeah. decisions are made here. So if you can only take in a couple of the really important impulsive things. You know, I've just seen a cake. I love Battenberg. Oh, I can't resist it. I know I'm putting on weight and I've got to stop. I can't take in all those other things about my health. I just no. see the Battenberg and I eat it. I'm impulsive. Yeah. And all of the impulsivity actions we take are because we didn't have the mental capacity here to take into account the other things. So you either get impulsivity or you get procrastination. It's a really important decision, but I, but I, I can't get my head around it. When what that means is I haven't got room in my thinking brain for all the things that need I know need to be taken into account. So you yeah. either get impulsivity or procrastination. You don't get balanced, solid, good decisions. Wow, it just blows me away. And I, I'm just thinking as well. Another thing. So we don't. You don't. I don't know if you want to even talk about this, but. Could this be a treatment instead of medication or alongside medication? Or both? Does it work well together? Would if, it... if you've got a Ferrari engine, mm -hmm. but everything else in your brain is from a Toyota, and there's nothing wrong with a Toyota or a BMW, it's absolutely fine. But yeah. if you take the engine out of a Toyota or a BMW and put a Ferrari engine in, you've got problems. Mm. You've, got, you've got too much power because the rest of the car isn't developed to cope with that power. So you get all sorts of frustrating things happening. Mm -hmm. so what medication does is let's bring down the power of the engine so it matches everything uh, else and so you can cope with it. I'm saying I don't like that. I, I want to develop everything else so it copes completely with the power of that engine. So that, that's my philosophy. So, but having said that, look, there are times when medication is necessary. Yeah. Someone has got an urgent need, then medication is necessary. So I'm not anti-medication. I'm just saying, don't That's expect the difference. It. Don't yeah. expect it to find and deal with the real root cause of the no. problem. I think some people like when you you're at a stage. Sometimes it's like when things get really normally by the time you get to a diagnosis that things have got so bad that you can't even be aware or acknowledge what's going on, then it's quite good for quieting down the noise while you explore other things, like you're saying, like then working out about the cerebellum and training or getting coaching or whatever it is you do. Um, but I was just curious to know the difference in it. So well, that's well, really do, good. Do, Dr. Ned Hallowell is a very famous psychiatrist. Yeah. Uh, he, he gave my program to his wife and to his son many years ago, and he's watched them for the last... 14 or 15 years thrive since he says they've never looked back, which is very nice. Wow. So he is now, he, in his last books, you'll see him describe, and he, he talks about this as being the, the best non medication approach to ADHD. And of course, this, this fits his whole, whole philosophy, which is about showing people the enormous, incredible strengths. That people with ADHD have. I actually, yeah. I'm with him because he wants to change the label. ADHD has been has been positioned as being a problem. Yeah, I, I don't see that. 
I see no, me ADHD, too. I see ADHD as a dirty great flag saying massive potential. Just get out there and find it. <laughs> me too. I'm on your team. And you know that Ned Halliwell is one of my heroes. So it's like we're all on the same. Because I do think you get the camps, don't you? Like where everybody's still focusing on what you... I was saying it on my social media this week is, you know, let's start focusing on what we can do and how we can make that even more amazing and not keep focusing on what we can't, you know? Well, we're, we're just releasing a whole training program. Uh, it's called the Halliwell Training Program, which combines the Zing program with Halliwell Training. So yeah. We- just launch that it's very exciting we've got a lot of people very excited and interested because it's combining his wisdom and his experience about about bringing out the best of every adhd symptom with our root cause dealing with the root cause so that that's that's one of the exciting things that we're working on right this minute that is so exciting okay so let's move on to zing performance and talk a bit more about that so firstly obviously i've been um, using your app for i think it's like 4 weeks now As you can see, I'm very smiley. I'm very like at peace. And I've honestly like didn't expect to feel this way. I mean, I knew it would work, but not, I didn't realize the profound effect it was going to have. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of background from when I started, I was in quite a, I would say hitting probably burnout, overwhelm state. And the only time I felt good was when I was exercising or doing yoga. Um, And I wasn't sleeping was a big thing as well. And I did the Zing performance exercises on the app, which is so good because I've been doing it on the train sometimes. Like for, for me, it's like oh, fitting wow. into the busy day. Like, oh God, I'm always, you know, on the go. How was I going to keep to it? And I think I only missed one evening. And, but I managed to like even go to the toilet if I was teaching and do them there quickly or, you know, because they're so, it's so easy to use and it's so short. It's like 10 minutes a day or something like that. Um, but the first thing I noticed was my nervous system started to calm down immediately, like the first week and I slept, which we know is so important. And then as the weeks have gone on, I've just felt like I'm focusing more. I'm more aware of, you know, the way I'm thinking, the way I'm acting or responding to things. And the biggest gift is I have so much still on my plate a big retreat coming up, which usually sends me into complete and utter panic, um, which they always do for the last, you know, I've been doing these for three years. They've always, I've always had the same response. And I normally turn up on retreat a bit like that. Mm. And I honestly can say, I'm so looking forward to going on retreat this Uh week because I know that I'm going to create something more special than I've ever created before because I've got inner peace. Like, even though I'm, you know, going to do run a big event, which Normally, I have to work really hard to get myself, you know, grounded before I go. And it's just there. And I think it's just been the most amazing thing. Well, I, I, can I share something? I, I'm not sure if I should, but I'm going to take a risk. Mm-hmm. I, I would love to run a retreat for a large number of people with ADHD and, and actually train them how to, do, how to do all of these exercises and how yes. to do the how to do the bilateral stimulation that's, that, that we do. So combining neuroplasticity with, with a form of meditation, with a type of bilateral stimulation, which is the most powerful way to press the reset button on our brain and get all of those connections that have given us all those problems, but also given us many upsides. Get rid of the problem ones. And like it's, it's a bit like, I don't think you're old enough to remember what it was to do alt, control, and delete on the computer. Oh, yeah, I do know that. <laughs> well, alt, control, and delete gets rid of all of the bad connections and plugs it back into the proper connections. Well, yeah. that's what we could do in a weekend retreat for people in a stunning, stunning way. I'd love to do that. and Just, just do what? it. Well, come. <laughs> well, I- I, I, you can organize it. You, I, I'm not. I'm good at I'd research. Love to. I'm not good at organizing these things, Rosie. Oh, well, I would love to do that. Honestly, that sounds incredible. You imagine the stories. You imagine the peace. You imagine the 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 feeling that the atmosphere, the energy that would be yeah. in a group like that. Honestly, it's an amazing app, and and the and the thing is, it's user friendly, which is so important because we see a lot of stuff that's like put out there. You know. For ADHD is some of it's just reading stuff or some of it's, you know, I don't know, listening. And some people work, you know, as we know, until they've developed the cerebellum, struggle with one of those. So this app is visual. Yeah. It's 
so engaging. It's even got the music. I love the little the, the song in the background. It's mm. just simple. No, you know, n- not hard to log in and put your passwords in. I have to remember it or remember it's for, for you. And it, and um, you can and have it, it anywhere you want. Like it's just so so good. And it's totally customized to the needs of your brain. So whether yeah. whether you're a 27 year old elite athlete or an 87 year old lady that's that's whose memory is in decline or whether you're a seven year old mm. child that's struggling at school or whatever you are you might be a high functioning uh 47 year old businessman making millions but are still trouble because you haven't got that piece the program has got so much artificial intelligence in it it customizes it every day to suit where you are and where your next stage of development yeah. Can I ask you an interesting question that happened week one, actually? And I wanted to ask you this. You know, you get the boosters or after week one, I started getting my boosters and you do the balances or the eye tracking with, they give you a list of something. Yeah. And one of the ones that I had was list some mu- like musicians that you like or yeah. something like that. And I was like, there must be, <laughs> what is going on in my brain? Because all I could come up with in that week was, two artists that I never listened to and it was most random (laughs) random thing and I was like I love my music and I know my artists that I love and I couldn't work out (laughs) why that was happening is there like a reason for that or what is that well the reason we add those boosters and just to explain boosters are what you have to think about whilst you're doing these physical exercises. Yeah. So the physical exercises are there to A, stimulate the vestibular, that's the balance organ. So there's different types of balance and we choose the appropriate type of balance you need for the next stage of development. We also are choosing or working out the right level of stimulation because if mm-hmm. we give you too much stimulation, we can make you nauseous. If we give you too little, it ain't going to do anything. So we've got to get the type and the level right, and then we combine it with some other challenge. And what we're trying to do is force the development of crucial circuits that are not to do with your balance and coordination, actually, but they're actually to do with the way the brain makes connections. In other words, the way the brain learns and develops processes and skills. So we're looking for how can we create better connections, better synapses in those areas. And one way of, of of making the brain work harder is to give you a mental task to do. So we that's what that what Rosie is referring to now. We give these these challenges, and we you can choose your own challenge if you want. But yeah, you what, can change what, them if they don't if you don't um, like want, effect, that, want a certain one. So effectively, what we're doing we're probing the brain to open up new connections in mm. new areas. So if you're if you're all you can think of is is is. <laughs> It's artists. It was a Tom. It was a Tom and Kitten and Pete Doherty. And I was like, I don't even think I even listen to them. <laughs> but but we're, we're forcing new parts of your brain to open up. So that that's what's happening, and it's a yeah. it's a critical part of the process. It was so interesting. I was like, wow, <laughs> I never even knew that was in there. <laughs> <laughs> With um, the next question, it's like a little a question I ask all my guests actually. Um, and usually it's in regards to their own ADHD. What gives you strengths during your most challenging days? And I, I probably know the answer to this considering your story. But if you have a challenging day, because like we all have them at times, right? What is your strength? What gives you strength? Never a day goes by when I feel sad because there's someone that's struggling. Maybe someone mm-hmm. has just attempted suicide or even worse, committed suicide that I know I could have transformed. So every day I realize what I've still got to do. So that yeah. that makes me focus. And, and, you know, if someone else was picking this up, if some major organization was saying, oh, this is exciting, we'll make sure it gets to everybody, I would be relieved. But that hasn't yeah. happened yet. So so that that's what... Yet. Keeps, <laughs> and, and, but that's just part of it. Yeah. The other thing that keeps me going is... Every day I get messages from people who did it last week, like you're you're just relating to me now. And thank you for that, Rosie, for being so open and, and, and upfront with it. Sometimes it's a year ago, sometimes it's 20 years ago. But people that come back to me saying, you changed my life, you did this, or you changed my child's life, like that professor who she's actually a, a quite a famous professor. Um, I won't mention her name because I haven't asked if I could, but she she said, How have you done this? 
you've trans- transformed my son's life all these years ago and now his life is he's just thriving in everything he touches i mean those you imagine how motivating that is so yeah. i either see people that i haven't reached or i get messages from people i have reached and they they more than keep me going i can totally relate to that and that's when you know that you're you know your true why and your purpose in this life so the other question i always ask and but i feel like we've covered it already is do you believe adhd can be used as a strength and i think we both agree on that don't we that 100% once well, ADHD to... needs complete rebranding yeah the symptoms are symptoms of strength the, yeah. the the limitations can be dealt with so the whole diagnosis process needs tearing up yeah tearing up and starting again before any diagnosis happens we should first identify what's the root cause let's see what development can take place let's see what negative symptoms exist if any after you finish the development before we think about any diagnosis it mm-hmm. wouldn't do the revenues of the big pharmaceutical companies much good if that happened uh, and i don't mean to knock the big pharmaceutical companies but i just want uh, you know my motive is i want people to lead, lead their best life yeah me too um and the last question i've got is for someone out there now say they've seen their children struggle or they're struggling with their own adhd maybe they haven't even got to the point where they've got a diagnosis yet because we know how hard that is or maybe they're not interested in medicating their children or the medication isn't working and just say they don't have access to your app right now or they don't have the resources to do that what advice would you give them at the moment what would you say is the first thing they could do to like start today like what hope or motivation would you give them right now rosie the first thing they should do is go on our website and you will find you will find an assessment dr ned hallowell's assessment which is based upon the what's known as the dsm5 assessment yeah he's added some crucial really insightful questions and he gives a report do that it's free they can yeah. do it they can do it in minutes and that will give them a very good clue are we talking about something that's totally relevant to them so they can do that for free if they decide to then go and do our program we make our programs very very affordable yeah so don't be put off by the fact that they're not expensive our motive is to help as many people as possible and they come with a money back guarantee that's because wow it, our heart is in the right place. Yeah. You know, people have often spent thousands, and we're not going to let them spend thousands on us, but no. they spend thousands, sometimes just on a diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, and, and and it's achieved nothing. So unless we can make a huge difference to your life, you ain't paying anything. So that that's where yeah. our that's where our heart is. Uh and so I you know, I I I just want to change people's perception of of the real potential that's lurking there behind these symptoms. Yeah. There was one thing actually that I've forgotten to mention because I want to talk about success stories that you've seen. But do you mind telling the story about, I think it was a, a guy that you said who was 45 and had never spoke before and yes. spoke for the first time. Can you talk about that? Because that was pretty profound think, well, success that was, story. That was on BBC television. Yeah, he's from the from across the east of England. Yeah. He was actually autistic, and his parents came to me and they said, "We've got a son. He's forty-five. He just follows us around very meekly, very rarely opens his mouth." Mm-hmm. And they said, "Do you think you can help him?" I said, "Well, we'll certainly have a go." And uh, he then said, he looked at his wife and he said to me, "We're, we're just scared to get old, because who's going to look after him?" Mm. And then, uh, to cut a long story short, he went through the program. And it wasn't long before he was at college studying. He went, used to get in the, he, he wouldn't, bearing in mind, he wouldn't leave their side. He used to go off on the bus and the train to go see his sister in London and, and and so on. And a few years later, his father called me up. He said, I must thank you again. He said, because we're not afraid to get old anymore because Jim is looking after himself. Wow. And that was just, that was just tear jerk. I went to see Jim. That was quite a few years ago. I went to see Jim. Uh, last uh, just after lockdown and it was quite moving he was living in a in a kind of sheltered home he was he hadn't hmm. been very seriously autistic but he was happy he was smiling he was looking after himself he got friends and yeah. he was looking after himself with, with another friend in an apartment you know a, a, the kind of life was never thought possible 
But the problem is, please don't think that this is just for helping reduce autistic symptoms. No. Almost everybody has got potential. I don't care how successful you are. There's some areas of the brain where you still haven't found all of the connections you could make. Yeah. I can't thank you enough, honestly. I'm so glad that I found you on a podcast and reached out because, yeah, it's blown my mind. So thank you for everything you do. Thank Rosie, you. thank you for helping reach people with ADHD labels uh, to give them a fresh understanding and fresh hope. And I'm looking forward to meeting you on that retreat you're going to set up. Yeah, yeah, me too. I can't wait. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to Untangled. I hope you find these podcasts as useful as I do. I always leave feeling so inspired and like I've learned so much about my ADHD. Let's get untangled and show the world what we are made of. <laughs>